In this video, we'll look at how we can take the basic model from the last video and extend it to improve its performance. And these are the topics we'll deal with. We'll look at how to control for user or movie bias, how to regularize, how to use implicit feedback and side information, and how to control for temporal bias. Most of these tricks are based on the system that ultimately won the Netflix prize. So we'll assume that we have numeric ratings since that was the case for the Netflix data. We'll start with the user bias. The average rating for each user is different. Some users are very positive, giving almost every movie five stars, and some are very negative, giving almost every movie less than three stars. If we can explicitly model the bias of a user, it takes some of the pressure of the matrix factorization, which then only needs to predict how much a user will deviate from their average rating for a particular movie. And the same is true for movies. Some movies are universally liked and some are universally loathed. If we can model this average rating of the movie over all users separately, then it becomes easier to model the rating for a specific user movie pair. We model biases by a simple additive scalar, which is learned along with the embeddings. We learn one scalar for each user, one scalar for each movie, and one general bias over all ratings. And as we said before, we can think of these parameters as taking some of the weight off the embeddings. If user i is very positive, and we don't include a bias term, then we'd need to set their embedding so that it's positive for all movies. With the bias term, the dot product just needs to model the distance to the user's average rating. The more weights and parameters we add for the users in the movies, the more likely our model is to overfit. If this is a danger, then it may help to regularize a little. We can do this by adding a simple regularization term over the parameters. And here again, we're using the Frobenius norm, which is just the matrix equivalent of the vector L2 norm. An important problem in recommender systems is the cold start problem. When a new user joins Netflix or a new movie is added to the database, we have no ratings for them, so the matrix factorization has nothing to build an embedding on. In this case, we need to rely on other information. And there are two sources, implicit feedback and side information. Implicit feedback is information that we can use as a proxy for a possible rating. For instance, if a Netflix user navigates to the information about a particular movie, then we know that they're at least relatively interested in the movie. We can also add a wish list or watch list to our interface, which gives us a collection of movies that the user hasn't seen yet, but they are likely to enjoy when they do watch them. And in some cases, we can even do things like recording cursor movements, so that even if the user doesn't click a particular movie, in the movie recommendation setting, we can think of this as implicit likes. We don't know for a fact that a user liked the movie as we do with explicit likes, but in the absence of better information, this can serve as a kind of noisy signal from which we might still learn something. There are many different ways of handling this problem and including implicit likes into our system, but this here is the method used in the system that ultimately won the Netflix prize. We start by adding a second matrix of movie embeddings, which we call mimp. We then compute a new user embedding, which is the sum of all these new embeddings of all the movies that the user has implicitly liked. That is, we simply sum up all the embeddings of all the movies the user has in some way been associated with. And this sum functions as a second embedding for the user i. Note here that ni is the set of movies with which the user i is associated through this kind of implicit information. And note that there is a slightly counterintuitive step here. We are learning movie embeddings, but their only function is to become a representation of the user. We then take this user embedding that we gathered from the sum of all these implicit movie embeddings, and we add it to our existing user embedding before we compute the dot product with the movie embedding. To understand what's happening here, let's look at the edge cases. If these implicit associations don't help at all, then all movie embedding vectors mimp will simply go to zero and the implicit information will disappear from the score. And if they help for some movies but not for others, then only for the vectors of some movies will they become non-zero. As we noted in the last video, we usually also have some features for the movies and the users as well. It's just that the ratings are more predictive, so we want to focus on those first. But if we can use the features for the users and for the movies to boost our performance, then this may also help us with the cold start problem. 
For movies, for instance, we could use features like the length, the genre, the actors, and so on. And for the users, we could use features like the country they're from, the language they speak, their operating systems, what time they log in, or perhaps information from their social media profile. This essentially gives us a big instance feature matrix like we've seen already in the classic setting. And we get one of these for the movies and one of these for the users. The challenge is to integrate this with the ratings so that we can extend the relatively sparse information we get from those by generalizing over the features of the users and the movies. To simplify things, we will assume that all features are binary categories. The feature either applies to the user or it doesn't. And then we introduce a set AI that is simply the subset of the features that apply to the ith user. With this, we can follow the same logic as we did before for the implicit feedback and add another matrix of embedding vectors, one embedding for each feature that can apply to a user. We sum up all the features that apply to user i and we get another representation for the user, u side i. We add this third representation for the user to the sum inside the dot product and we compute our score as before. We could do the same thing for the movie information, but we will take that as red so that we can keep the score simple. One final thing we need to look at is the influence of time. The Netflix data is not stable over time. It covers about seven years, and in that time, many things have changed. The most radical change comes about four years in, when Netflix changed the meaning of the ratings in words. These appear in mouse over when you hovered over the ratings. Specifically, they changed the one star rating from I didn't like it to I hated it. Since people are less likely to say that they hate things, the average ratings increased. That doesn't mean that the movies got better, the movies stayed the same, but the meaning of the rating as a numeric value changed. Another way time influences ratings is if you look at how old a movie is, you see a positive relation to the average rating. This is because generally people who watch a really old movie will likely do so because they know it and want to watch it. Whereas for new movies, people are more likely to be swayed by novelty and advertising. This means that for older movies, the ratings are more likely to be higher. Both of these, absolute time and relative time, can be modeled by making the embeddings time dependent. We add an argument t to the score function and we make the user embeddings and the user biases together with the movie biases a function of time. A very practical way to do this is just to cut time into a small number of chunks and learn separate embeddings for each chunk. So in this case, time has three possible values, t1, t2, and t3, and we learn separate user embeddings for each chunk of time. We still have the same number of users and the same number of movies. There are just fewer ratings in R. The more chunks we cut time into, the better we can model the time dependency. But the worse our individual embeddings get, since we have less and less data per chunk. Here is how the different additions to the basic matrix factorization algorithm ultimately served to reduce the root mean squared error on the Netflix data to the point that when the authors of this article, the Netflix Prize. So that brings us to the end of recommender systems. To summarize, when you're faced with a task that consists of linking one large set of things to another large set of things, based on sparse examples and little intrinsic information about those things, then it may be a good idea to model this as a recommendation task and to apply a matrix factorization algorithm. To improve the performance of your model, you can extend it with biases, regularizers, implicit feedback, side information, and temporal dynamics. So that's it for recommendation. In the last videos of the lecture, we'll take a few quick looks at other places where embedding models can give us a new perspective, and then we'll finish up with some general notes on how to validate embedding models.